I'm Kib Sterling. Okay, what do you do? I'm a philosopher of biology. Philosopher of biology. So that, that means you know something about how biology works. Uh, I hope so. Now this Whether I do is for others to judge. Okay, now this is terrestrial biology we're talking about. Yep. Okay, so uh, let, let's just start out with the question, are we alone? Are we alone in the universe? Uh, you mean as sentience or as life forms? I mean... That's, that's two questions. Yep. Answer, give me two answers. Okay, I think it's pretty... Look, the real answer is we don't know. You know, and we don't know because we don't know how unlikely life is to evolve. I think there's a pretty good chance that there are lots and lots of planets in which life could evolve. Um, if it does get going, uh, um, then my, my best guess is that we're not alone, you know, in, in terms of intelligence, um, so long as it's got going in a fair range of places. So let me again understand this. If the question is, are we alone, are we life forms alone, then that depends on whether life evolves elsewhere in there. You're not an expert in that and yeah. you don't know. Well, I don't think anyone knows. I don't think anybody Yeah, I don't think we've got a good model of how life starts. And because we don't have a good model of how life starts, we don't know whether it's an incredible fluke, you know, that we've got it here, um, or relatively likely, you know, if you have a reasonably hospitable planet. But I've been going around, I've been interviewing about the, the top dozen people in the world who are trying to make life, and mm. they did not give me that same answer. Some of them think, oh, we know uh, that it, uh, we know pretty much, we, we have an enough of an idea that we can predict that, oh, it'll probably be common in the universe. For example, to do, Christian to do says, oh, life is a cosmic imperative. He knew a lot about cell biology, presumably more than you and I know, so that was his prediction. It's everywhere. But you think that he is either overstepping his expertise or what? I think he's overstepping his expertise a bit. You know, I mean, we'll know that they've not overstepped their expertise when they start making it from scratch. You know, that, that would certainly be, you know, uh, as convincing uh, as, as could be. But as far as I know, you know, no one's, you know, even made any sort of really big, you know, sort of structures which go into you know, to life from scratch. N nothing like a cell wall, nothing like, nothing like a, a, a gene, uh, nothing like a protein. Uh, things out of which proteins are built, that they've been made from scratch or, all right. Now, you use the word from scratch. Now, let, can you be a little bit more specific? From uh, elements which are clearly, you know, uh, you know prebiotic uh, or abiotic. Prebiotic or abiotic, like urea, for example? Like urea, for example. How about amino acids, for example? I, I, think, I think people have a pretty good idea of, of natural circumstances under which amino acids would arise. So using amino acids wouldn't be cheating. I see. And, but how about uh, nucleotides? How about uh, AGCT? Well, the, again, I think nucleotides are reasonably simple chemicals that people have a reasonable idea of, of how you could, you, you could get the... The chunks from, you know... So you mean the monomers? You the monomers, If you yeah. can do, make life from monomers, then yeah. you'd be happy. Yeah. And if they're going to cheat and use poly polymers, then that's no good for you? Well, it, it, I mean, no good is, is putting it too strongly. <laughs> I mean, after all, you know... You know, these would be huge step forwards to even do that, wouldn't wouldn't it? But you wouldn't you wouldn't have the whole kit and caboodle, you know, under those circumstances. Okay. Now, Simon Conway Morris wrote a book you have in your hand. I do indeed. Can you show us that book? Uh, okay, Life Solution. Yeah. And in two thousand and five, you wrote a review of that. Can you show us your review there? There's okay. <laughs> there you go. Your review. So one of the so I'm going to ask you about your review in this book. Yep. Now. It's my understanding that uh, in astrobiology, we're trying to answer the question, are we alone? And the contribution that the study of life on Earth can make is the following. If we find that something has evolved independently more than once, that makes it a better candidate for having, existing elsewhere. Do you agree with that logic? I think it's, it's, it's good logic. Um, there's a bit of a catch you know, which is exactly how independently is independently. Okay. Um, so in some sense, if you look at the whole of life on Earth on the assumption that there's just sort of one origin, none of it's completely independent. You know, 
you and ye you and yeast aren't completely independent. Me and a mushroom aren't completely independent. Nonetheless, if you can show that something evolves, you know, in the mushroom lineage, and so and something similar evolves in the you know the primate li lineage or the the lineage of animals, or for that matter, you know, the lineage of, of plants, you know, you've you've shown a certain degree of independent origin uh, and that in turn makes it more likely that things like that will have evolved elsewhere in the universe. Okay, let's talk about eyes because uh, I keep on reading eyes. Oh, it evolved X number of times independently. And then when I look at the data, what I see is that the biochemistry and the common ancestors of these supposedly independent evolution of eyes were the same. They were shared by the common ancestors. So I hear this word independent evolution of eyes and if you're thinking of, oh, you know, the color of your eyebrows or the shape of your irises, then yes, that's independent. But, the, but an eye includes many fundamental things and many superficial things and they keep on, the independence is in the superficial things, not the fundamental things. Is that, would you agree with that? Not entirely because I think, again, the gradient from superficial to fundamental is one of degree. Mm -hmm. So take your eye and an, and an octopus eye. Mm -hmm. You know, they have similarities which are more than just superficial. You know, you know they're, they're, they're structural. You know, they're, you know, in both cases, the eyes work, you know, through a single lens with control with oh, control wait, of the lens. We have a common ancestor with octopi about, I don't know, 800 million years ago. Yeah, but that common ancestor didn't have an eye. Did it have the, did it have the bacterial, did it have rhodopsin in it? I Light sensitive pigment? I think so, but I'm not, I'd, I'd have to check that, but I'm pretty sure it did. I'm pretty sure it, it did too. Yeah. So it had, Light sensitive pigment, but would you call that an eye or not? Well, it doesn't, doesn't matter whether you call it an eye. What it certainly is, is one of the evolutionary resources from which eyes can be built, or complex eyes can be built, if that's the way you like, like, to, think, like to think of it. Well, how about if I called it an eye and then I said, the, then, the, then there is no independent evolution of eyes in octopi and, and primates? In that case, you know, fine. And then someone would say, okay, but there's independent evolution of complex eyes in, oct in octopuses uh, and uh, not just primates, of course, but uh, Okay, so whose know, eyes are more complicated, vertebrate eyes or octopi eyes? I think they're about as complicated as one another. Okay. Well, it depends on, you know, sort of where, as it were, the eye, st eye stops, you know, and the brain starts. But, but in terms of the structure of the eyes, they're, they're, they're both complex and complex in very similar ways. Okay, so you think that that the common ancestor did not have a what you would call a complex eye. Yep. So some of the now I guess we could look at something that has, was a closer proxy for the common ancestor of uh, I guess vertebrates and octopi, and then look at its eye. I guess like a chambered nautilus or something. I'm not quite sure what that would well, be. A chambered nautilus is in the same lineage. You know, uh, so I'm not even sure that if, if they know what the most common ancestor is of uh, metazoans and and uh, uh, mollusks, uh, but again, I'm fairly certain, I'd have to check, but I'm fairly certain it, it would not have a complex eye either. It might well have a simple eye. So you want to say that... It might have an eye spot, you know, uh, or something along those lines. Uh -huh. So you're happy with the use of the word compl complex? Because uh, people used to use advanced and lower and higher, mm. and that language I thought was something that had been banished from all enlightened biologists. Lower and higher certainly gets you know, a raised eyebrow if you use it. Primitive isn't you know, you know uh, advanced. Yeah, primitive, yeah. Is, these are words is, that are thrown around all the time. Yeah, is is not you know well regarded either. But I think at least when you're, I mean, it's very, you can't compare, say, the complexity of an eye to the complexity, you know, of a nose. You know, the, the systems, you know, are too different. Uh, but when you're looking at, at, at eyes, mm -hmm. um, uh, I think often, you know, sort of talking about simpler and more complex, it, you know, it makes reasonable okay, sense. Simple and so let's talk about, so what critter on earth has the most complicated eye? No, not complicated, complex eye. I don't know. Um, I would, th I'm trying to remember the name of this creature because I know there is one. You know, uh, it's a marine creature uh, and it, it, it like, it's like us in, in having, you know, a focal, focal eye and stuff like that. But it's able to sort of, it's kind of got a bi bifocal eye. So it can focus, 
you know, oh, both see above the water and underneath, and, water? And, and underneath the water. Oh, I see. That's so, pretty cool. So our eyes are simple compared to it. Well, uh, more simple. And anyway. how many times did that complexity evolve? I don't know. Okay. I only know. I mean, I've never, I've never checked. So let me see. The bottom line is, whether you say something has evolved independently or not depends really. You have to be careful about what you mean by the thing that yeah. evolved com uh, yeah. independently. And you say complex eyes, you would accept that as having evolved independently. Yeah. And I would say that's baloney because you have the same thing. You have a, an 800 million year old common ancestor that had an eye. You're just calling it simple. But if you went back there and said, hey, you're simple, then it's like, oh, yeah, I can do this and this and this and this. And you say, oh, I didn't understand that. Maybe you're more complicated than I thought. And so that would undo the whole idea of complicated because you're defining complexity as something that you have and something that's similar to you. And that's kind of cheating. Well, in a way, the claim for convergence and what you can, you know, infer from convergence doesn't even really depend on whether the octopus eye and your eye is in some objective sense more complex, you know, uh, than the whatever the common ancestor had. What it depends on is the claim that you've got two structures, you know, uh, that evolved independently of one another. But uh, we had a common ancestor. Uh, Pardon? They had a common ancestor. They had a, they right. had a common ancestor, so but the common ancestor... So the claim is that your eye and my eye have structures and not merely superficial structures that the common ancestor didn't have. Well, that's always the case, no matter what you're talking about, that so as species diverge, they diverge in, in different ways. They can diverge in, in, in different ways, but as you said, sometimes those divergences are, you know, you know, relatively superficial, your term, not mine. Okay, you, you know, use the term parallel, for example. You yeah. talk about parallel evolution. Yeah. So that presumably depends on, you know, two species separate, diverge, they have, they have a common ancestor with a lot of stuff. Mm. Those common an that common ancestor had some regulatory genes that can go switch, switch, and they can, oh, by the way, I switch here, switch here. They both had nose and they both got longer. Mm. You could say the common ancestors didn't have a long nose, but both of them did, but they did because they had shared regulatory mechanisms at, in the common ancestor. Yeah. So you wouldn't call that uh, convergence, would you? I wouldn't call that convergence, but again, you know, the difference between convergent, convergent evolution and parallel e evolution, again, it's one, some, it's one of degree. That's so and this is something I don't know, and I don't know whether anyone knows, you know, to what extent, you know, uh, does the octopus eye and the, the, the large eye, you know, the complex eye we have in the vertebrates, to what extent do those depend not just on, you know, one or two, you know, inherited switching genes, they certainly, you know, have, have those, PAC6 uh, uh, and whatever they call PAC6, you know, uh, in the octopus, but all the other regulatory mechanisms that you need to build, you know, a complex structure, were they are they the same, you know, uh, in us as they were in octopuses? If that were to turn out the, the case, I'd think of the octopus case as much more a case of parallel evolution and much less a case of convergent e evolution. Okay, so that so would undermine the logic that we want to apply it, to it, try to predict what's elsewhere. It would indeed. The more these cases of convergence, you know, what look like spectacular convergence turn out to be largely parallel and and depending n not you know uh, depending on shared you know inherited developmental resources the the less reliable that inference would be from it's evolved lots of times on earth so it's probably evolved elsewhere as well yeah I, i'm a little bit on the side of the deep homology part of this argument i think hey everything had a common ancestor therefore to say that something is independent in the rigorous sense that we need that independence to be to hold if we're going to apply that to elsewhere i would say i don't see that anywhere on earth well i agree if you think that to get any bite you know from this convergence argument the independence would have to be complete as far as we know there's no complete, no complete independence, independence so you don't you get know, any bite you, know, you don't get get any. if 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 that's what you think if you think you need if it has to be absolutely independent with no, you know, but it seems to me that, and I don't know whether empirically this is the case, but 
if, say, you could show that sensory systems, complex sensory systems, you know, uh, evolved with a little bit of shared, you know, d developmental resources, after all, it's, you know, the same, you know, DNA, you know, uh, code, uh, but not very much more than that. Um, then I'd start to think, you know, uh, that that is, that is evidence that you could have some confidence, you know, that you get somewhat similar evolutionary tra trajectories elsewhere. All right. Now, um, Carl Sagan and had a debate with Ernst Meyer in mm. 1995-96, and they talked about the issue of whether we should or should not expect functionally equivalent humans elsewhere in the universe. Carl Sagan said, yes, there are many independent ways to become sentient or like a human. And what he meant by that is functionally equivalent, so sentient in a generic sense. And Ernst Meyer says, no, no, that, that's, that's crazy. We've only seen this type of thing happen once on Earth. And every species is unique. Humans are unique, just like every other species. So that is, that's just not the case, that you would see human-like intelligence evolving elsewhere in the universe. So what is your take on that debate, that issue? Um, a little bit in the middle. So, I mean, again, a lot will depend on how much you pack into functional equivalence here. Um, so, if by functional equivalence you mean, say, creatures that are able to store information, you know, uh, about their environment, you know, that they're not just living in the now, you know, but that, but they can store uh, in information. In DNA, chemical, or in neurons? In, or whatever their equivalent of neurons is, you know, uh, but store in information ontogenetically rather than phylogenetically. Um, uh, if they can combine, you know, uh, information from different modalities, um, from different sen sensory modalities. Uh, so an epigenome, for example, an epige because it's res it responds to the environment, would be a way to ontogenetically do this rather it than might, phylogenetically. Yeah. Um, uh, if they can use that information, you know, uh, in, in real time. Turn on or turn off yeah, genes. Turn, yeah. Um, then, you know, so if if you have a broad con conception of what counts as functional equivalence, you know, you know, the ability to store and use information adaptively in an environment, um, uh, and uh, presumably only humans can do this on Earth. I oh, know, you know, every every organism can do it to some extent, or it's not, not but every he, organism. He uses but functionally but, but, equivalent but, humans. That's yeah, what he's but, talking about. Well, if he means functionally equivalent to humans in a really rich sense of functionally equivalent to humans, you know, so that we could have a, a chat with them. Or build a rel telescope, radio telescope, or a spaceship or something. I think that's what he meant, technological, you know, they we could uh, see them, you know, you, the, peop the kind of aliens that would build spaceships and UFOs and things. Right. Um, Now, I guess the real answer is I don't know, but I'm about to give you some speculations, you know, that might, you know, so on, Ma on Mayer's side, he's right, you know, only one species out of, you know, many millions, you know, uh, evolved, you know, that capacity on Earth. On the other hand, you know, uh, it only took, um, you know, 500 million years of animal evolution to find that, that, that one animal, you know, given, you know, the predicted l lifespan, you know, uh, of the sun, you know, and that, you know, could have, you know, could have afforded another thousand, you know, million years or more, more to look. Uh, so the optimistic way of saying in only 500 million years from the origin, you know, of, a of animals, you know, we got an animal that was smart enough, was good at learning from, you know, from one another, so it had the capacity to accumulate information over the generations. That's, that's a really, really important, you know, fact about human intelligence. You know, we didn't, no individual has to work ev everything out for themselves, you know, uh, so we inherit information from our ancestors, we build on that information and we tra transmit it. Took 500 million years, roughly, to make an animal that could do that. So you're saying, you're using the, we're the first argument. We're the first and we'll probably be the last on Earth, you know, because we've stopped anyone else doing it.
but suppose we had gone extinct, you know, there was a population bottleneck, you know, uh, in Africa, you know, according to the geneticists, you know, about 80 to 90,000 years ago. Suppose, suppose we hadn't made it through that. Suppose the Neanderthals hadn't made it through the, th through the Ice Age. Suppose the Denisovians had been wiped out in the Ice Age as well. You know, so, you know, suppose we'd got, you know, once the Ice Age had, had ended, you know, there were no humans, there were still some great apes and stuff like that. Um, there's still another thousand million years to, 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 to find another species that could do that. But the detailed descriptions of our almost unique adaptations, you could say so the same about any species. Sulfur-crested cockatoos, for example, they are the first sulfur-crested cockatoos to evolve on Earth and probably the last. So every species is, if every species is unique, then every species is the first of its kind, and what is misplaced is the statement of its kind. Well, that's what, why a lot in this argument turns on how finely or coarsely you understand functionally equivalent. You know, so yes, you know, cockatoos, you know, are no doubt, you know, the first and only, you know, species of cockatoo to evolve on, on this planet. But they're Probably not in the universe but, too. But, yeah, and no <laughs> doubt in the universe. But they're not, you know, the first whole nesting, large, noisy, you know, uh, you know, bird to evolve. Uh, you know, there's actually quite a lot of, you know, you know, go to New Zealand and you'll and you'll meet you know kias and carcas. Uh, you know, go a bit further out west. You know, uh, and there are corellas. Yeah, but they're all related to each other. They have a common ancestor. For example, even the idea of a head. A head is a monophyletic thing. So head. If you go back early enough, there's only one unique species that had a head, and so heads are unique. Or you go back. Hey, there is one ancestor that we have that produced all animals. So anything in the animal kingdom, they have a common ancestor, so they're deep homology, they're related, and so there's no independence, and so the whole argument falls apart, I, I thought. Well, the, the, the mere argument was that we only ever got intelligence on Earth once, and that's the argument. Human I'm, intelligence. Yeah, yeah, hu human-like intelligence on Earth once. Yes. Now, that's the argument I'm saying. You can soften that conclusion, con con conclusion Conclusion of it. I mean, it's not By doing what? It's strict. It's not strictly true. You know, of course, because uh, you know there are other extinct you know hominids who were also they have uh, a common in, ancestor. Our common ancestor had yes, a big brain. But they're all. It's true. They're all closely related. Yes. You know, um, uh, and all you know, all the parrot-like animals. You know, are, 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 are closely, are closely related. related. All the animals are closely yeah. related. So, but as I say, the the the, the mere argument was. You know, you're crazy to think, you, you know, that you'll ever get intelligence more than once. Now, as I say, I think that argument was o overstated. Now, you know, you know, what could, what, what might be happening, you know, you know, on, o on other planets with, with, with life? Well, I mean, I mean, I said that there was one, you know, sort of big unknown, you know, uh, which was how like, likely how lo likely was life to get going. I guess there's another big unknown, you know, uh, which is how likely are you get likely to get something like eukaryotic, you know, uh, life going. Um, so, so suppose you get bacterial grade, you know, life, life going. I think, you know, uh, you know there, there seems as far as I know to, to have the, the transition from, you know, sort of prokaryotics to eukaryotic only ever took took place once, you know. So again, I don't think we have a good understanding of how probable or improbable that was. I mean, whether that was an incredibly fluky, you know, experience, or whether if you have enough, you know, bacteria roaming around a planet, you're quite likely to get something like that. Okay, but the point you just made seems to undermine the distinction you made in the beginning. You said in the beginning, if you're only talking about life, I don't know because we don't know about the origin of life. But if you're talking about once life gets going, then it's likely right. that you'll have intelligence. And but I think then you said, I'm, oh yeah. wait a minute, there's another bottleneck here. Yeah, I overstated that first remark. Yeah, I think there's 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 two potential bottlenecks. You know, uh, one is the life bottleneck, and and the other is the the transition to eukaryotes. Uh, and it seems that once you get eukaryotes, you get multi-celled life, because multi-celled life seems to have evolved quite a, quite a few times. So let's do a thought experiment. Mm. Uh, let's take a 
the eukaryotic life and mm. spread it all around the universe yeah. on rocky planets with water. Yeah. And then according, your prediction would be that it would evolve into technology after a certain amount of time. I'm I, not sure that I'd commit myself to that, but it, it doesn't strike me as wildly unlikely in the way that <laughs> Mayer thought that it was wildly unlikely. Okay. I mean, nor do I think Sagan was right in thinking it's bound to happen. You know, um, okay. I, as I say, doesn't strike me as wildly unlikely. It doesn't strike me as the sort of thing you'd want to bet was bound to happen okay, either. Recently, we astronomers have made a lot of progress in finding exoplanets. We yep. find planets everywhere. Yep. As a matter of fact, the new default is that every star you see will have some type of planetary system, mm. and probably a large fraction of those will have rocky planets in the habitable zones with water. Yep. Now, if that's the case, and I think there's a good chance that that is the case, um, well, uh, where is life? Where is, where, Fermi paradox, where is everybody? If the universe is filled with rocky planets with water, with all the ingredients for life, then, I mean, one solution to this where are they question is, oh, it's life doesn't get started very easily. Yep. Another question, another in human-like intelligence building telescopes and rocket ships doesn't, doesn't happen at all. Right. And the other would be every, but every time it does happen, they self-destruct. You, among those three, or you can think of any other, do you have a favorite solution to the Fermi I, Paradox? I don't have a favorite solution, but there is a fourth one. I mean, the, I mean they are a long way away, um, uh, and we're, pick, we're starting to be able to detect planets. I don't think we're in the situation where we could detect whether or not those planets had, you know, sort of solar system bound, you know, uh, civilizations on them. We're working on it. Sometime soon. Sometime soon? Yes, sometime soon. Right. Well, I mean, that would, would then, you know, if, if you crack that one and there's still no sign, you know, then that eliminates, you know, one, you know, possible solution to the Fermi paradox, namely that they're out there but their signal's too, too faint to detect. Well, well... Um, so, so I think at the moment there are four. You know, four. Yeah, that, you know, four life, bottlenecks to it. The yeah. origin of life. The origin of life. You know, the 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 transition to multicellularity. Right. You know. Uh, but do you mean eukaryogenesis, or do you mean multicellularity? Here? Well, I think that's you, something we haven't talked about yet. Yeah, euca eukaryogenesis. If I'm right in thinking that once you get that, you get multicellularity as well. If that's wrong, you know, then there would be a third third bottleneck. Fourth bottleneck, you know, is, you know, how likely do you, is it that you get intelligence once you get multicellular life? Mayer obviously was sceptical about that. Um, then there's your suggestion, you know, uh, intelligence self-destructs, uh, and then there's the, 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 the final option, uh, intelligence doesn't, you know, create a strong enough signal for other intelligences to detect okay. at they're, interstellar distances. They're out there and we can detect them. Yeah. But that, if that's the case, then, uh, you know, one of the, part of this Fermi paradox is that if you have technology and you travel at a rocket ship only 10% the speed of light, you can colonize the galaxy in about a million years, and there have been about 10,000 times a million years in the history of our galaxy. And so if there was only one, it would only take a million years and it should have been here already. You're supposing that this rocket ship isn't just going at 10,000, you know, you know, uh, what is it? 10, I'm supposing 10% well, the speed of light. 10%. Because the galaxy is 100,000 light yeah, years it's across. Yeah, also, it's also got to be very, very reliable to get from one place to the other without every everything dying, you know, Just on like the a life form, it lands, builds some stuff, it goes further, lands, builds stuff, it goes further. Life forms are very reliable in that sense, right? Life forms are reliable. Well, that's what we're talking the about, a life form that creates Yeah, a but the technology of getting from one, you know, the technology from getting from one solar system to another, that's... We're just about to send a postage stamp to another star, Project Starshot, financed by Milner, right? The $100 million he donated to do this, and people, NASA and others are putting together a interstellar mission for the first time. Right. Yes. Well, to think about that. Good yes. luck to them, right? Good luck to them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk about major transitions. Yep. And I've got a big problem with that because it's you for example, David Christian put together a 
a, you know, hey, what's our place in the universe? And he built this, he used the scaffold of the major transitions to help students understand uh, how we got here. Yep. And the problem I have with it, maybe you can correct it, when I look at a phylogenetic tree, mm. and I look at all the organisms that are alive today, yep. and I go from the root to one of the branches, and the mm. root to one of the branches, and the root to another branch, every single one of those pathways goes through some transitions. And which ones are major or not will depend on where you're going. For example, if I go to E. coli, that's alive today, and if I look at the root of the tree of life and then go all the way to E. coli, which are alive today, all kinds of things have happened along that pathway. And for an E. coli, they would call those are the major ones, those are the important ones. So it seems to me the whole language of major transitions is subjective and dependent on which branch you're on. And that's, if that's the case, then there are no major transitions that are objective. Well. So push back. Push back. <laughs> I'm happy to push back. Um, I think the idea, I mean, the concession, you know, what counts as a major, as, as a major you know, thing, transition is sensitive to the phenomenon you're interested in. You know, that you want to explain, you know, I mean, you know that's so, something like that uh, is all is always true, uh, but I think you know. Okay, so, I accept your yeah, apology. Yeah, but but <laughs> but you know, I think Maynard Smith and Zathmarie were right, you know, to think that certain changes in evolution. Among Chain, a, our lineage or uh, among all um, lineages? Amongst a whole range of lineages, you know, though each, uh, well, in some cases these changes were, you know, lineage, you know, lineage fusing events, you know, uh, so um, the formation of the first eukaryotic cell was a lineage fusing event uh, after all. It wasn't a change that occurred in one lineage, it was two, two you know, it was two lineages. But there are all you know, kinds come, of crazy things happening all the time in all the branches oh, of sure. life. Oh, sure. There's all and sorts so of crazy... If, I, if I'm a, a critter who is has a short branch length to the root, people well, say, oh, you're primitive. And I say, are you kidding? Nothing has, a short, nothing has a short branch length to the sure root. Sure they there's, do. Some there's, branches there's, are there's, longer than others. Y yes, there's some... There's, there's, well, they're all four billion years long. That's or true. About. In time, yes. Yeah. But in terms of sequence, no. Yeah. And yeah. when you mm. find the LUCA, mm. then you say, okay, which has the shortest branch length to LUCA? You can identify that. So, mm. so for example, methanogens or core yeah. yeah. or nanarchs. Yeah, sure. So if that's the case, I, I go and investigate the methanogen and say, what has happened between the LUCA and mm. this currently existing organism, and they'll say, oh, look, at this happened, and this happened, and this happened. These are the major transitions of life. And that's very, very, very different from anything that Zamari and, and... Well, I think they think that some transitions change the rules of the game. For that, us, but yeah, not for them. Well, no, it changed the rules of the game for them as well, you know, because, you know, for example, you know, once you get multicellular animals, you know, uh, you know, multicellular life forms, you've got a whole range of new, uh, you know, uh, environments and possibilities for bacteria and things like that to, 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 to colonise. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not as though, you know, uh, you know. But I don't care as a methanogen whether I'm in the gut of a cow, a human being, a, uh, a C. elegans worm or whatever. I said those are just, that's just... <laughs> That's for me, it's uh, wurscht. It doesn't make any difference to me. I'm still doing my thing. It may not make any difference to you as a methanogen, yeah. but it does make a difference to the life, for, you know, life forms which are now possible on the planet. You know, I mean, you got, you know, so as I say, the, I, I think the idea, you know, is that some transitions, you know, change, change the, the possibility space for what is now possible. And I think that's right. You know, I mean, you know, putting together the first cell you know, you know. Yeah, but you know. we're use the word major. You didn't say what's possible. You said the major transition. If you just said, hey, a, the range of transitions is now larger, I'd be fine with that. But if you say major, you're saying these are more, these transitions are more important than these other ones. They're, they're more important because they, they open up, you know, possibility space, you know, in the way that, that others don't. But that the, is the claim. But the and size, I think that, and, the size and the, of possibility space is surely a subject. There's no metric on possibility space that, hey, the size is bigger over here and smaller for a methanogen because you guys only developed 
you know, no, for example, no, what... the, the, the possibility space is conceived of for life as a whole, not for a particular lineage in life. You know, again, at least that is the argument, and I think that that argument's plausible. You know, uh, that. But if I took mm. the major transitions in that book and yep. plotted it into 1997 Pace Tree, there'll be all kinds of things happening here, all kinds of things happening here, and here's eukaryotes, and then a tiny branch. 90% of the major transitions are from here to here, a tiny, tiny fraction of this tree. And, and for some reason, so I said, that's crazy. I can't have all the major transitions. Like, hey, I grew up, and by the way, I got two eyes and my bilateral. All these are major for me, but they're incredibly unimportant or not a large fraction of possibility space if you're talking well, about actually, the chemistry most, and physiology. Most of the major transitions are getting to the first cell. So in fact, you know, oh, you know, you know, most of them are getting the first cell. I, I think thought there were only from, one or two. I there. think about four of them were, but we'd have to, we'd have, we'd okay, have. Okay, so I'm a virus. Yeah, I'm a virus. Yeah. I say, you know, I'm I'm alive today, and yeah, well, uh, no major transitions led to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, actually, the major transitions did lead to you because we had, we had to had to build bacteria before you could have have. Well, maybe viruses. the virus has built the bacteria. Yeah. To, uh, I don't think that's the received view. You, that no, not, that isn't the received wisdom, but I, it's yeah. something that I wanted to throw in there yeah. anyway. Okay, so let me ask you again this question. Are we alone? And now I have to actually give you my best guess. Even though it is just a guess? No, I don't think we're alone. And what's the best evidence you have to back up that guess? Not much at all. You know. the, I didn't ask for what. I said, what, what's the best you have? I didn't say whether it's good or not. I just said, what's the best evidence oh, you have? Oh, it's, it's, the, it's the bit of astronomy that you told me, you know, that, that, that we, we now have pretty good reason to believe, you know, that there are, you know, almost uncountable millions, you know, uh, of, of planets, you know, uh, where life, you know, could get going. Billions, not at least yeah. billions. Yeah. Not millions. Yeah. Billions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that that strikes me as a reason for optimism. It does. Okay. Now, but that's not the bottleneck that you're referring to. I guess the bottleneck was maybe the origin of life. And if you if you make it a really, really, really small probability, then you multiply it times a very large number, yeah. you have life. Y yeah. Um, okay, so you answered the question of are we the life forms on Earth alone with a probably not. Mm. Okay, but then you pointed out there are two questions there. How about we, the sentient, a human-like intelligent life forms? That's the second question, and the answer is? I don't know. But your best guess is? Best guess, if I really, really, really had to make a best guess. Mm -hmm, you do. Um, probably not. Not alone. So, so probably not alone as life form, probably not alone as a technological human yeah, intelligence. Yeah, that, and that, what's the best evidence you have that backs that up in your head? Why, why do you say that? It's mostly hope, to tell hope, you the truth. Wait a minute, we're scientists here. It's we're, most, we're scientists. But you told me that I had to guess. And I I'm know, dead. but yeah, scientists yeah. are supposed to use evidence or at least suggestive, <laughs> yeah. indirect evidence, but not hope. Yeah, look, I mean, if, <laughs> yeah, my, my real belief here is I don't think we know, and I don't think we're, we're even in a position to, to put a kind of probably yes or probably no on that one. With the, the getting going of life, you know, I think there's just now likely to be so many planets where it could get going, you know, uh, that I think, you know, there's a reason, pretty reasonable chance that it is. Um, but suppose it's only, you know, if it turns out that life is incredibly fluky, but the, but the universe is big enough so the flukes happened, you know, not once but 50 times, you know, so there's 50, 50 worlds of life, you know, that then, you know, we would need to know in a way that we don't know just how likely it is to transition, you know, from, from bacterial type life uh, to life involving multicellularity, uh, uh, and structural complexity. My mathematical friends tell me that there's something called uh, sets of measure zero, in which no matter how big a number you multiply it by, you still get zero or one yeah, or something, yeah, a yeah. finite number, not an infinite number. Yeah. So that seems to be out of the can of most people who think about this problem, but I'd like to introduce it into the discussion here. So do you think that humans are a set of measure zero? 
you mean literally humans, something, so going, going to, you know... Uh, Wait, let's just talk about you, you. Yep. You, Kim Strelny, are you a set of measure zero in the universe? What I mean by that is, in an infinite, we think the universe is spatially infinite, therefore there's an infinite number of rocky planets out there. Right. And, uh, and how many of, of you are there in the universe? And if the answer is only you, then you're a set of measure zero. Okay, I reckon I'm a set of measure zero. You do? Yeah. Okay, so could humans be a set of measure zero? They, humans, the, 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 the species. The species. Our species. Yes, I think we're a set of measure zero. Or could animals be a set of measure zero? Next question, could vertebrates be a set of, no, vertebrates and animals, then you, could eukaryotes? Could life be a set of measure zero? It could be, but I think that's much, much, much more unlikely. Why? Because it's a more generic set? Because it's a more generic set. But if you go back to the origin of life, mm. that genes, generis, genericness, it's like a head. There are hundreds of species with heads, but, oh, and therefore it must be common. But if you go back, there was only one species that was a species-specific characteristic to have this head. Now, but you've just said a, a species could well be a set of measure zero. So that means a head could be a set of measure zero, an animal could be a set of measure zero, and even life could be a set of measure zero because that life had a common origin, and that's essentially the same as a species today. Right, but, you know, head, you know, head evolved once, it might have evolved you know, uh, again, presumably the development, you know, by parallel e e evolution, you know, once you start ramping up the number of characteristics which have to evolve again in the same lineage. So in, in the, say, the, the case of humans, it's not just intelligence, you know, uh, it's the, you know, you know, you know, you know, how we engage in sexual reproduction, you know, how I, eyes work, the number of teeth we have, and so on and so forth. You, add, you know, each, each time you add, you know, uh, a sort of typical feature of humans, you know, uh, you're, you know, and th these don't just have to re-evolve, they have to re-evolve in, in, in the same package. But, but now you're, you're making it less and less yes. and less likely. Yes, you know, but, but you're just you making me, epsilon lower and lower and lower, but yeah. there's a threshold between the epsilon as low as you want and sets of measure zero mm -hmm. that I have a hard time understanding because I'm not a math, good enough mathematician. But you, what you just described is making epsilons lower and lower and lower. Mm. But I'm saying, well, wait a minute, sets of measure zero, you already gave me that. You might be a set of measure zero. So... I think I probably am, a, you know, because to get me, you know, you would have to get both my genetic code okay, or how something. How about we? How about we? Are we a set of measures here? You, you mean you and me? Yes, yes, yes. Well, I would assume that Since you it, might be. We both would be even more. Set of exactly. Measures. Yeah. Okay, I mean, the, so the chances of the chances be... of the of, of a, you know, if the chance of there being another me is <laughs> almost minuscule, and the chance <laughs> of there being another you no, is being measures. another minuscule, no, no, then no. the chance of there being both of us wait, is wait, wait. minuscule wait, multiplied by minuscule. Minuscule and sets of measure zero. Yeah, They're yeah. very different concepts. Right. All right. Well, maybe I haven't got set of measure zero quite right. I mean, I was taking a, a set of me measure zero to be, you know, probability zero, basically. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Is that, is that, is yes. that the... Yes. Th that's it's the... like having an infinite number of balls in a cage and you pull out one, you pull mm. out one, there it is. Mm. What was the probability of pulling that out? Zero. zero. It's like yeah. the probability is one divided by infinity. So yeah, I'll, yeah, you know. yeah. So, um, so as I was, well, you know, so is it literally true, literally and strictly true, you know, uh, you know that there's zero chance, you know, of being a, a phenotypic and genetic, you know, uh, duplicate of me? Is it a possibility that that's the case? I would say yes, but I would like to hear your view on that. If... I sus I I have to I'd have to maybe have a bit more of a think about it, but I'm still inclined to say no. Um, you know that well, you just the, said you were just about yeah, two minutes and yes, and yeah, so, right. yeah. Well, I'm conf I'm dithering. Okay. Yeah, I'm here by dithering. You're allowed to do it <laughs> yeah, as a yeah, philosopher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm 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 officially and explicitly dithering <laughs> okay. uh, on, on 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 this. Um, I mean, on the one on the one hand, I'm tempted to say, 
if something's happened once, it can't be impossible for it to happen twice. You know, and, and saying it's a, 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 a set of measure zero is surely to say that strictly impossible for it to happen twice. Um, uh, and so, you know, you know, my existence is 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 proof that it's possible to have one, and if it's possible to have one, how could it be impossible to have two? Okay, what's so, the set of measure of the? So, of so we're speaking of English language, right? Yeah. Now, so, what, so is that's that a set the, of measure zero. So that's the you know. So that's the argument for thinking that it couldn't be a set a, a, a set of, of of measure zero. If something can happen once, you know, it can't be. Literally I, would can happen, no, I would say not can happen. Something has happened yeah. once. There's a big difference between can. When you okay. put the word can there, you're putting a possibility. Yeah, okay. When you say has happened, that's a different. Okay, different. so if something has happened once, you know, that means it's not impossible for it to happen. Yeah, well, yeah. The inference no, from 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 the, the the inference from something is actual to something that is po well, is possible you, is surely you know a pretty sound inference. Let me give you a counterexample. Okay, yeah. let's say I'm, I'm a physicist. I have an electron between zero and one. Okay? Yeah, the electron is somewhere there. Yeah. If this electron has an infinitely precise position, mm. then it's a set of measure zero because I have an infinitely number of digits that has to be used to make it precise. If, however, that no, that such a infinitely price, precise pre precision is not something that exists, mm. then yes, it can be it have a certain probability to mm. it. And with which of those cases is real? The one that corresponds to that which of those models corresponds most closely to our universe yeah. is, I think, a highly debatable issue. Okay. And if that's the case, then sets of measure zero obtain a whole new realm of possibility. Right. Okay, I hadn't sets of measure zero, as it were, weren't in my conceptual framework, you know, uh, uh, until mm -hmm. until talking to you just now, um, and my reasoning about them is still, you know, fumbling. Um, okay. uh, so as I say, I was, you know, so one line of thought was pushing me towards the view that no, it can't be literally a set of measure zero. But the other line of thought was, was sort of, as it were, you know, multiplying out the improbabilities, you know, uh, and they were, the, the number was looking, you know, one over an extremely large uh, number. So, so maybe, maybe it's not strictly and literally a set of measure zero, but it, it would be an extremely close approximation to the set of measure okay. zero. So if we have a, a number n of planets, yeah, and if we have a probability that is a lot, lot less than one on n, yeah, then you're not going to get it. Uh, but if you have n going to infinity, an infinite number of planets, then the only time you can only have one if you're a set of measure zero. Yeah. Okay. Do we we don't. Do we think that there's an infinite number of planets? So do we think do we think that the universe is is literally physically infinite? Uh, the entire universe it looks like it's spatially infinite, but oh. we have the observable universe. That's the only part we can see, yeah. and that is definitely finite. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk. There, Carl um, Arthur Clarke said, "Any sufficiently advanced civilization will be indi will be indistinguishable from magic. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic." And there's a German guy, Carl Schroeder, who says, no, no, Arthur, you're all wrong about this. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. And those are two views. And the idea is if you really have a lot of technology, you will be sustainable and ecological and you'll recycle and you'll be tree hugging. In other words, you won't cut down the train rainforest. You'll just have technology everywhere that somehow has made its peace with nature. And so it's indistinguishable from nature. So those are two, two very, two different views of the future of technology and, and technology in the in the universe. So do you subscribe to either one of those? And the reason why that's important is because if it's indistinguishable from nature, then we may have already seen lots and lots of extraterrestrials, but they're just so at one with nature that they're kind of like, oh, they're stars or they're you know uh, vacuum energy or they're the things that we usually say, oh, that's just nature rather than life forms. Well, I guess the, the Clark point is, you know, uh, that if we met, ter you know, uh, extraterrestrials that could safely make it, you know, you know, from nearby stars 
to here, they would be able to do things, you know, that would be so causally opaque to us, you know, that would seem like magic, you know, um, and that's pretty plausible. You know, you know, the the alternative view, view is consistent with that because it's a claim not about what they could do, you know, but what they do do, and and you know, how do they use their technological powers, you know, to to you know, to integrate and, and live sustainably uh, 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 and unobtrusively, you know, uh, uh, in the universe. I hope that that view is true, but I, I don't okay. think that there's anything in the history of human technology that would give you a lot of grounds for optimism. <laughs> well, we're hoping. We get, yeah. you, hope. It's called the hope. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. How about if I gave you $100 billion with the caveat, you have to use it to try to answer the question, are we alone? Either one of the versions that you mentioned. Right. Uh, what would you do? Well, I would try and set up the most sensitive listening and detection, you know, uh, devices that I could, you know, you know, to, you know, to see. Uh, electromagnetic detection? Electromagnetic detection, um, you know, to see uh, if we could find traces. No you know. neutrino detectors? No uh, gravitational wave detectors? No I mean, microscopes? I don't think microscopes. Sorry, what microscopes? Electron microscopes to look at maybe the aliens or nano aliens. Uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not persuaded that they're nano aliens. Yes, it would be. You wouldn't think that's, that, you're not going to spend any money there. <laughs> not, that's, that's not going to be a research priority, let's say. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All yeah. right. All right. Um, and how about uh, some of my astronomical colleagues think that we should not be looking at planets. Planets are stupid. What we should be looking for are robots because any sufficiently advanced technology will build robots and then live in outer space, and they're, they're no longer organic, therefore they're no longer uh, fixed to a rocky planet with water. They're just robots, and so they're made out of metal and silicon, and they're computers, and they don't need to breathe air, and so they can go everywhere. They're not limited to the surface of a planet. Uh, and therefore, that's what, we'll, what we will find, so that's what we should look for, rather than looking for, you know, obscure gases given off by some biology on the surface of a rocky planet with water. What do you think of that? Well, I mean, two problems with that. You know, one is there's a hell of a lot of fucking empty space to look at you know, in, in trying to find robots there. You know, so I don't fancy their chances. You know, uh, they could be anywhere. Yeah, They're yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, and secondly, you know, you know, you're just taking guesses, you know, uh, about the about the the psychology of aliens, uh, but as far as guesses go, that doesn't sound like a particularly plausible plausible one. I mean, you know, if we had all of this fancy technology, does that mean that we would want to go off and live in the middle of space? Well, our, um, but our first exploration now in we space might, and probably our last will be robots. Now, now I, agree, I agree. The 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 space exploration vehicles will. Almost would very likely indeed be be robots, but they're just likely to be really fucking hard to see compared to a planet. Except that they're giving off radio frequency, a very very narrow frequency band, you directed back to the planets or, that they or, yeah, that they they come from. In that case, mm -hmm. you know, um, with, the, with the beam that's wide enough, so it would yeah, spill over. Yeah. Now, now, I mean, in, in the in the money that you so kindly you know uh, you know gave me to play with, uh -huh. uh, I would certainly be uh, you know uh, hoping that the um, research grants that I was you know, applications I was reading would include, you know, at least some ideas, you know, about how you might detect, you know, uh, such, 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 such robots and their uh, electromagnetic but, but spectrum. But not microscopes, huh? Not microscopes. <laughs> okay. no, no. Sorry. Right. <laughs> sorry, for, sorry for those nano guys, but yeah, <laughs> they'll have to ask Bill Gates, I'm afraid. <laughs> All right. Now, you may have seen the movie Contact based on the book by Carl Sagan? Uh, I read the book Donkeys years ago, but, you know... You haven't seen the movie? I haven't seen the movie. Uh -huh. I see almost no movies. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, in the movie, I'm not sure whether it's in the book because I haven't read the book right. yet. I'm, I have it, but I haven't read it yet. Uh, in the movie, at, towards the end, 
Uh, a little kid comes to see uh, the uh, the VLA, the Very Large Array in New Mexico, and, mm -hmm. and, and Jodie Foster's character, she's the woman, the Jill Tarter character. Yeah. Uh, she's The little kid asks her, um, are we alone in the universe? And her kind of answer to this child, Jill's answer to this child, or Jodie Foster's answer is, well, if we're alone, it'd be an awful waste of space. Now, that's a semi-moralistic kind of answer. Mm. It's kind of funny. It's kind of cute. But yeah. what do you think of that? Uh, it's not a good answer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a kind of theological answer, really. You know, it's, it's as if the, the universe had the purpose of, you know, you know, being, you know, providing living space for sentient beings. I mean, you know, maybe there are sentient beings, you know, scattered around the place, but uh, not because, you know, someone set it up that way. It, it reminds me of not, not only speciesist, but kind of a racist comment, because it reminds me of what the, you know, the English said when they came here, terra nullis. Mm -hmm. Oh, it'd be an awful waste of space if there are no civilized people here. Yeah. Oh, there are no civilized people, therefore it's a waste of space, yeah. so we can just take it over. So that that yeah. that rubs me the wrong way in all kinds right. of ways. Okay, now this course that we're talking about here, mm -hmm. this Are We Alone course, is for uh, students and of history, of philosophy, of English, of uh, you know chemistry, all kinds of students. Yep. So, do you have any advice for how they they can constructively think about this issue? How we how did we get here, and are we alone? Uh, well, I, mean, I guess the Drake equation is the obvious place to start. You know, I mean, it was, it's famous because it was a sort of a way of formulating, you know, some of the questions that had to be answered in a crisp, clean way. On the other hand, we talked about one of those terms, and that is the frequency of intelligent life. Yeah. And that's something that you said, oh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, the are we alone problem is, it's a pretty intractable problem, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, that's not, that's not a reason not to think about it. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and not a reason not to have a course about it. But, you know, it is a difficult and intractable problem. And then if, you know, all the kids learn from it is, is, is to sort of, realize just how deeply intractable it is, you know, just sort of what the problems are in, you know, trying to put kind of credible estimates, you know, uh, on those probability values, they'll have learned something important. Is it an important question? Yes, you know, um, uh, it is a very important question. Um, I mean, it's, as I just said, you know, possibly an intractable question, but that doesn't mean it's not important. How about the connection between how did we get here, figuring out how we got here, how life started and evolved? What's, what's the connection between that understanding, and a lot of people are doing that, and then asking the question, are we alone? Because presumably we are a member of the universe, whether we're somehow generic and life is everywhere or very, very set of measures zero and unique, that's what we're trying to figure out. Is there any way to figure that out by studying what we have here on Earth? Yes, I think, certainly we can make progress on it. You know, and we've made a bit of progress on it, but there's, there's kind of huge things that we don't know, but which if we, if we could make progress on, would, would really help here. You know, uh, and even though you're just dis you were disparaging a bit ab about the concept, you know, you know, uh, you know, things like you know major transitions. How likely is it that once you've got you know uh, prokaryotic type life, how likely is it you know uh, that you would get you know you 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 karyotic, you know cells? How you know likely are you karyotic cells to to form you know multicellular you know, uh, uh, organisms and under what, what circumstances. You know, if we, can, if we could get a, a you know, clear empirical handle, you know, uh, on those questions and, of course, the origin of life question, that would, that would give us a lot more ammunition, you know, uh, in thinking about the, these elsewhere questions. 
One book, you, I guess you may have read the book about Planet of the Apes. Have you seen the movie there? I, I, I read Monkey Planet donkeys years ago. Oh, is yeah. that the name of the book that it was based on? Yeah, Monkey Planet. Yeah, but, yeah. It, but it's Ape Planet, not the monkeys. Uh, it was called Monkey Planet. Really? In, in, yeah. This French guy wrote it. was a French it. guy, okay. yeah, yeah. Called Monkey Planet. But yeah. wait a minute, but there's no distinction in common French between monkey and ape, I think. Ah, uh, that may have been in, a... In German often, but they don't right. have a... Okay. It may, it may well have been a translation phenomenon. Okay. Okay, all right. Case. Anyway, put that aside, semantics. Um, in this book, in the scenario, we have an Earth, and, uh, you know, Charlton Heston lands on a planet he doesn't know where it is, and mm. then he sees these English speaking, horse riding, corn eating mm. uh, apes, three yeah. of them, three, mm. and he doesn't know he's on, the, on Earth, and yeah. I think that's the most unscientific thing I've ever heard of. Yeah. And plus, it's a 24 hour day, and there's oxygen 20% in the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, put that aside. Um, now, if you believe, I think you may be someone who believes in what's called an intelligence niche. That's what, uh, that's kind of like the background assumption that Carl Sagan made when he thought there's many ways to get to human-like yeah. intelligence. So if there's an intelligence niche, in this book, humans kind of like kill themselves and they kind of minimally self-destruct in the sense that they have World War Three or Four or Five and right. they marginalize themselves. They turn into mute kind of rats that live in the gutters. And then... The chimpanzees and the, and the orangutans and the gorillas simultaneously evolve into this human-like intelligence niche, which is now unoccupied. Mm. So I think that's a crazy idea. Yep. It makes little sense to me. What do you think? Of I, it? The crazy idea it makes <laughs> little sense to me. <laughs> but, then, but now here's the thing. But you're in the position, though, that you think there is some multiple ways to get to this human-like intelligence. But yeah, you're but not in, willing to call it a niche that other species but, but would But don't forget, in this case, you know, you know, this goes back to what we were talking about, functional equivalence and how coarsely versus how finely you understand functional equivalence. You know, I mean, the thing, you know, in, in, the, in the Planet of the Apes movie and, and, and Monkey Man, you know, you know, basically what you're, in effect, you, it, you were having the, the re-evolving of hairy humans. You know, um, so it wasn't just sort of functional equivalence. It wasn't that there were some animals on this planet that were starting to use, you know, sort of technology, uh, but, you know, with, you know, radically different sort of, you know, social lives and, you know, nothing like a human language and so on and so forth. You know, so, so that's the stuff that I, th you know, think is completely barking crazy. So you think they converge too narrowly upon Much something. too narrowly and richly to have any plausibility at all. Okay, let's let's go 200 years into the future and let's suppose that we humans kill ourselves. Right. All right, but there are all kinds of other creatures, maybe some, you know, lots of cockroaches, maybe some squirrels or something, mm. I don't know, maybe octopi around. Yeah. Uh, use your knowledge of the evolutionary transitions and the evolution of life on Earth to figure out how long will it be before anything builds a camera or it, a telescope? It, it could be forever. Could be forever. Yeah. Or? I mean, it'll certainly, you know, and so what did you need, you know, uh, you know, for the sort of, you know, you know preconditions, you know, for human e evolution, you needed, you know, already quite large brained, you know, uh, you know, animals, you know, animals which were capable, you know, you know, of sort of, you know, you know, general learning, uh, st stuff like that. So, so what is is there around now that have, you know, kind of baseline capacities like that? Well, look, look the the great apes do, but we will if we kill ourselves, we will certainly kill them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, dolphins, you know, uh, uh, almost certainly, but they don't have any fucking hands. You know, so they're stuffed when it comes to sort of, you know. Uh, Te technology. So, what are the basic ingredients out of, out of which you might get, you know, an intelligent lineage re re reforming? Something that's social, under some selection pressure for increased cooperation and social learning, you know. Uh, so termites. You know, something with good social learning skills, you know, which termites don't have. You know, um, uh, not that you know. Yeah, right? uh, uh, and 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 fairly good trial and error learners, you know. Um, uh, so if you've got something with, with, with sort of those three or four, you know, ingredients, there's some kind of chance of, of getting a, a trajectory Okay, I have a, prob I have a problem with what you just described. What you're trying to do is take human-like intelligence and then say it belongs to a group and I will just describe that group and that's what you just did. Mm. On the other hand, uh, you, 
I guess we're the only member of that group today. The only living so you, member. You created a generic group of only one species, and you're pretending that it exists when, uh, compared to the other organisms now, they don't exist. Well, I'm, what I'm what I'm saying is, you know, I would see it somewhat differently. So, what were the conditions which allowed humans? Presumably and admittedly intelligent, you know, you know, uh, uh, lineage lineage to evolve, capacity to manipulate their environment, social, good social learners, under un, under selection for cooperation. Because well, wait, wait, wait. Let me stop you there. Because let instead of thinking about human-like intelligence, let's ask the question about the English language. And I say, what were the conditions that allowed English to evolve? And you could say, oh, something with, or any human particular mm. language. And I could pretend that I could go through some generic features of th that were part of the evolution of English, but to, to pretend that you could end up at that pr exact position of English Who's, is kind of... Who said exact position? Be, you know, well, you're you know, pretending I, no, that human no, intelligence I, is not exact. I mean, I... Right? I, no, I... You're saying you're, you're using generic words to describe what is a pretty exact human-like intelligence. That means species-specific. And then you're using words that are not species-specific to describe the thing that is species-specific. No, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is identifying some general capacities, you know, which, which you know, humans along with other, you know, uh, animals, you know, you know, had that were the evolutionary preconditions you know, uh, of, of human-like intelligence and saying that if you had, you know, you know, after the, after whatever, you know, Holocaust, you know, sort of, you know, through which we disappear, if you had creatures around, you know, with those, you know, capacities, with those preconditions, there would be a chance, you know, uh, of, uh, you know, future evolution, you know, taking them down a pathway something roughly resembling ours. Never so going to be any, never going to be more than roughly resembling, and you probably wouldn't get it. Hmm. Okay, so let me ask you to, to wrap up this interview. Mm. Uh, let me ask you the questions that we're most interested in is, are we alone? I thought you'd already asked me that I did. Question. I wanted to get, every time you answer, it's slightly <laughs> different, so I'm getting right. a collection of your answers. Right. So are we alone in the universe? Uh, in virtue of what you tell me about the sort of very large number, you know, of probably life habitable planets, you know, uh, billions and maybe more than billions, uh, m I would guess not in, we're not alone in terms of being the only, li you know, this isn't the only planet in which there's life. That, that, I think that would be my best guess answer to that, you know, uh, best guess answer to whether there are other sentient, you know, uh, life forms in the universe, don't know. And I don't think we even have good probability estimates. You, in your answers, you used two words. One was life and one was sentience. Mm. And I'm not sure we know what life is. Do you, can you, do you must have had an operational definition that you used when you said that. And I don't think that, that we do know. I don't even think we have a, anywhere near a, a satisfactory definition of life. For example, some, if you go to biologists and say, hey, our virus is alive, half of them will say yes, half of them will say no. And so that gives you a good representation of do we know whether viruses are alive or not. I'm somebody who believes that, hey, life is a member of a far from equilibrium dissipative system like Ilya Prigozhin would say, and therefore we've already detected life elsewhere. The star, the star is alive, the galaxy is alive. And, and so, is there a boundary worth preserving between what you described as life, the way you just used it operationally, and the more general kind of no boundary vision that I'm trying to present here? In general, I don't find kind of haggling about, you know, sort of definitions very productive. Um, obviously, the, the, the more generously, or you know, that's not the right word, um, the more inclusively, you know, you define life, the more likely it is that we're not alone. You know, uh, you know, so that if, you know, 
any, you know, far from equilibrium system, you know, is a life form, you know, then clearly we're not alone. As you point out, stars are life forms. They don't reproduce, you know, uh, you know, they don't, you know, you know, I, you know, you know, but, but as I say, there's no, there's no point haggling about definitions, you know. Um, so instead of haggling about definitions, you know, I'd simply, you know, provide exemplars, you know. Uh, you know, so if someone said, well, what, do you, what do you mean when you think, you know, uh, probably we're not alone, I would say, look, probably, you know, uh, elsewhere, you know, uh, there are things, you know, that, that are... Interestingly and importantly, similar to bacteria and archaea, you know they have, you know, uh, you know they have, you know, structures, you know, you know, which viruses are viruses are viruses alive. Don't care, <laughs> you know, and the reason why I don't care is that viruses can never be alive by themselves. You know, they de they depend, you know, uh, on other life forms to get their you know, reproduction done. You know, so you're never going to have, you know, a world, you know, which is just viruses. I thought all life forms depended on other life forms. N not for, not in, the, not in the way that viruses, you know, you can have a world which are just, which, you know. They're more dependent yeah, on other yeah. life forms. Yeah, I mean, forms. there are, you know, you can have a world in which there are just bacteria. You can't have a world in which there are just viruses. Indeed, we presumably did have a world in which there were just bacteria and archaea for what, you know, you know, some hundreds of millions of years. I thought the RNA world was more like a world that only had viruses. I don't, I'm not sure how, um, no, no, the, R, you know, the, the, the viruses, you know, the R, RNA world, if there was an R, RNA world, they weren't co-opting, you know, the reproductive machinery of other life forms mm -hmm. in order to have their, okay. you, know, right. you know, their nuclear, right. you know, copied in order to get their RNA copied. Uh, so I don't think, you know, if there was an RNA world, RNA forms were virus-like in that sense. So if you're a ribozyme and then you outsource your own reproduction, you're no longer alive. You were alive and then you're no longer alive because you're dependent on other apparatus to do that. Well, you're not, you're not alive in the sense that you could be the only, you know, life form on that planet. 